Good evening, friends. I'm Dr. Ajay Shah, and we are bringing you this another great Facebook Live tonight. Tonight, I have a guest who happened to be a pediatrician, but now she has ventured into not just helping kids, but helping parents, particularly helping mom. So we will be talking to her for a whole hour. A lot of uh, great topics and great questions, and you know, she is, uh, she's here to answer all the questions, concerns we have as parent, as dad, as mom. Uh, let me tell you some update on our page first. We just crossed our 40,000 follower mark, and that's only in about six, six and a half months. So that's a, that's a great achievement in, in my humble opinion. Uh, thanks to all of you. Thanks to all of you for inviting your friends and family. Thanks to my family. Thanks to Hannah, our social media director. And our goal here is to take all of you in this big team and grow together, learn together, you know, motivate each other and keep getting our health journey, our healthy lifestyle, keep going for the next 30, 40, 50 years. So, you know, again, congratulations to all of us for achieving 40,000 mark. So let me welcome Dr. Payal Patel. Welcome, Dr. Patel. Welcome, congratulations on the 40,000 members. Uh, thank you, thank you. Now, we, I think we are all in a team and we need guests like you to motivate mm -hmm. and, uh, and teach our followers and that's how we're gonna grow. So let me ask you the first question. Where do you live and what kind of medical practice are you in? So um, I live in Los Angeles, uh, born and brought up in California. And I work as a general pediatrician for a large corporation. Um, I work per diem right now. And since the pandemic has been on, uh, we've all been pretty much home, um, working from home or either just been home. Okay, yeah. And who's in your family? So, um, uh, my husband, who is also a physician, he's a cardiologist, um, wow. and my two boys, um, one just turned eight and the other one is turning six next week. So he's full blown ready to talk about all his birthday presents. So that's where we are right now. That's great. No, I think your hands are full. I think, you know, being a busy physician, mom yeah. with two kids, wife, I mean, that's, uh, that's very commendable. So we'll talk about that also. So let me ask you the first question, which applies specifically to a physician like you. You call your practice, your title, a mindful coach doctor. What do you mean for, by, what do you mean by mindful coach doctor? So um, when I started uh, integrative medicine um, with the Andrew Weil Institute, um, there was a lot of talk about mindfulness. And growing up, I kind of heard about it. it you get exposed to it because a lot of times we're in a certain environment in a certain community that we just throw words around. And I was thinking like, well, how can I apply being present in the moment um, to my life, you know? And then I thought I have to be genuine. Right now, I'm in a season of life where I'm a parent, you know? And how can I be present and in the moment with parenting? And so that's when the mindfulness kind of came into place uh, because there's a certain kind of idea we have in our head when we think about mindfulness and we think about like a monk sitting upright, you know, uh, with the water stream, or we think about some stone stacking. And I felt like, but that's not only mindfulness. There's more to it than that. And what I found most important was finding those moments where you're just focused on what you're doing. Um, it could be with your family. It could be with your children at work. Um, so that's why I decided to you know, work in my business by promoting mindfulness and parenting. Yeah, I think uh, that's an, uh, an excellent point. I think uh, we obviously love to go to Tibet and sit you know, hours and hours and days and days, but in <laughs> real life, that typically happens to yeah. only some, some fortunate people. I think we are all like urban monks. I think there's a, there's a I forgot his name now, but he's from California also. Uh, Shijam or something. I think he's a. He calls himself an urban monk, and he has written like okay. many books on it. So I think I agree with you. We all are like urban monks, and I think uh, yeah. that's where I think uh, uh, that's where I think uh, your your approach as a mom, as a physician, and as a a, a regular American is very important. Many of us forget that uh, no matter how busy we are, we need to take a moment to slow down, take a deep breath, and actually enjoy the moment we have and how to be in mindfulness. And I think mindfulness has a 
a lot of studies done in terms of uh, mental disorders, including anxiety, depression. But it also has now studies in terms of uh, long-term uh, longevity, in terms of mm -hmm. cardiac issues like heart attack and heart mm -hmm. disease and stroke. So I think mindfulness has become its own field now. So I'm glad you are diving yeah. into this thing. And this is upcoming field. So I think uh, many people will probably be following you. So my next question to you is that you are going through this life coach school right now. Mm -hmm. So explain mm -hmm. us because we have heard about health coach. And what is a life coach as a physician would offer to their, for example, your patients, the parents of your patients. And I heard also that you are also helping many physician mom to coach on their life. So tell us about this life coach school. So um, coaching in the simplest form is uh, someone who helps you get perspective on your mind and your life, right? So um, that's such a broad way to think about it, but the basic concept is that you are not your thoughts. You can choose the thoughts that you think will serve you in the present moment. So you get the mindfulness in there too, right? Yes. You can choose that. All this time, I think growing up and just going through this stage when my kids were so young, um, I felt like I didn't have a choice. You know, I felt that you kind of like, okay, I don't, I don't, I, I cannot go. They're young. I have work. You know, the husband, all these kind of things came up and I felt like I couldn't write my own story. When coaching came into my life, which was very unique because I only was exposed to it because a friend of mine was going to the life coach school and she asked me, can I practice on you? So I was like, yeah, like who doesn't want mine free? Like, yes, I'll do it. I'm like, I love therapy. I love this too. And to be honest, until coaching came into my life, I felt like I didn't have any control, you know, because things happen in life, you know, and you don't have control. Now, if I find myself thinking a certain thought, I ask myself, is it giving me the result that I want? Because if it's not, then that thought is not serving me. And you just let it go like a passing cloud and then pick a thought that is going to get you the result that you want. So that is the basic kind of understanding of coaching. And the reason I actually mostly only work with women physicians, like I don't work with anybody else because I am them, they are me, we're the same, right? And I, I honestly say, I'm like, I wouldn't take on a client that I couldn't help, but I know, I understand the lifestyle, the pressures. A lot of time it's dual physician families. There's the extended family. Culturally, we understand that very well. You know, we're talking about like in-laws and, you know, so there's so much similarity and I feel that we all accept it as that's how it's going to be. No, I think that makes so much sense. I think we all always had coach in the life. We probably did not put the definition as a coach. Like our parents coached us, our uncles coached us, our grandparents coached us, our friends coached us. So I think coaching always has been part of our life. At the same time, as we get older, sometimes some of those coaches Unfortunately, either you know, either they pass away or they actually have their own responsibilities, and we are in need of a coach who can be independently and without any bias can be yeah. guiding us, can be coaching us. And person who already has gone through similar kind of situations in their life can be the best coach. I agree with you. I think uh, yeah. you are actually you are not just taking the load of the work which you can handle, but you are also specializing into a specific segment of population, like a physician moms. And I think, uh, I think, uh, I think uh, to be honest with you, that actually is a very noble thing to do because uh, most physician moms are juggling so many responsibilities, mm -hmm. like every woman for that sake, every woman. Mm -hmm. But I think physician moms, physician and stress, physician and average lives about 10 years less than an average American. I mean, mm -hmm. even with the best of the healthcare, based of the knowledge they have about the health, they still live less than an average American because physicians carry a lot of stress. So I think uh, I'm glad you are you are definitely helping this uh, this uh, physician mom. So next question to you is this integrative medicine uh, from Andrew Weil. I read many of his books. Mm -hmm. I really admire him. He looks great. He feels great. And he's actually been always my my role model, actually a pioneer, almost 40 years, very well trained. Mm -hmm. And uh, so tell us what that institute uh, entails to and what are you learning from them? So, um, so 
Dr. Weil, um, he was like the founder of integrative medicine. Like he coined the term. And at a time when you, if you talked about this stuff, people would be like, you're crazy. Like, you know, this kind of stuff is like, where's the science behind it? So what he did was he created this institute, which is the most well-known and well-rounded institute that teaches us how to integrate um, medicine with evidence. Because there's evidence, you know, as doctors, the first thing we say is what's the study? You know, what did it show? You know, where's the evidence? And so that's what I love about this institute that integrative medicine is the study of uh, um, healing of a patient after we look at them as an entire individual, not just the physical, um, mental, but really the emotional and spiritual aspects of it. And it's so unique because this is the kind of work that you can't just next patient, next patient. In pediatrics, I'll tell you, like in an hour, I can see minimum four patients. You know, like, and I'm sure cardiology is a whole different story. Um, integrated medicine is not, it's not about quantity, it's about quality. You really take your time and you listen to them and you realize, okay, this person has these spiritual beliefs that can help us to encourage them to treat their diabetes in a different way. Yes. It's yeah. so crazy that you're like, wow, like this is such an old concept, such an Eastern medicine concept that yeah. we, we, the pendulum has swung so far that we're like, oh, we don't believe in that. That doesn't exist. Ayurveda has been around forever. Yoga, hypnosis, like botanicals and herbs. And so now everyone is like slowly like, wait, this is good. There's evidence that this has worked. They used to live hundred years and all that back in the day. And why are we dying so early? And you look at it, it's our lifestyle. No, I so agree that's what it's about. Yeah. No, I think I agree. I think integrative medicine, functional medicine, lifestyle medicine, you know, all different names in a way, but they all entail to going to the root of the disease, not just the symptom of the disease. And that's where some of this combination of East and West comes in. And obviously, evidence base is must. We all have to follow the truth. We all have to follow the facts. And we all have to follow the evidence. But at the same time, because of industry interest, pharmaceutical companies, hospitals, even some of the other lobbying, some of the food industry, a lot of this evidence has been actually, you know, kind of stashed away. Whenever there is a study on lifestyle, that study is many times not even read by mainstream media or not even published on TVs and newspapers because all the influence from the industry on their editorial board, many of this, like we will never hear the benefits of cruciferous vegetables because there is not much money in making money into it. So I think we need people like you. Even I put myself in that category that we need to take this uh, selfless uh, uh, baton, selfless uh, uh, mission to educate people everything we know about Eastern, Western medicine, the things which work at the root cause of the disease, the root cause of the problem, not just a temporary relief for the symptoms. And that's what I think I'm glad you're doing that. And I think one day, you know, if I get a time, I'll definitely look into it. I did get board certified new lifestyle medicine two and a half years ago. And to be honest with you, I think, I'm sure you can agree with me that now when I spend 20 minutes with the patient talking about their life, talking about nutrition, sleep, other things, I actually become better of their friend than just a few years ago when I wrote a Lipitor, for example, it took me 10 seconds to run a Lipitor and I did not make any bond with my patient. I lowered their cholesterol, but I did not become their friend. I did not improve their sleep. I did not improve their diet. I did not improve their arthritis. I did not improve their mood. I just lowered their cholesterol. I did not do anything else by writing the Lipitor. So now with integrative medicine like you do, and with the lifestyle medicine I try to practice, I actually become a lot better of a friend. And to be honest with you, and you can maybe tell me about it, that that actually has a very beneficial effect on myself too, because mm -hmm. I actually have a less chance of burnout if I mm -hmm. become a lifestyle physician or an integrative physician. So please expand on that. So um, it's interesting. The reason I went into integrative medicine was not to be a pediatric integrative physician. It was because it kind of called to me. Like my lifestyle was, we're, we're plant-based already in our house. I've always been plant-based. I'm very particular about making sure certain things we buy organic. Um, so it just like, 
I do yoga, you know, meditation is just like a normal thing we grew up with. So um, I felt like I wanted to do something more. And at this season of life, when it's like, I've been out of residency for over a decade, I'm like, what can I do that is going to be a calling for me? And I just kept thinking about it. it took me two years to actually pull the trigger on that, you know, because I was like, I don't know, it's like, it's in Arizona, but we do it online. So that's helpful. But it's a lot of responsibility. When I got there, it was all about how can I learn this for my health? Because I'm a pediatrician, but I'm sitting there, I'm like, ooh, arthritis, like, what do I do with that? Or, ooh, like cardiovascular issues, all, you know, like GI, like, what do I do with those things? And so most of the program, it's pretty much self, like, serving me. Um, and then also, like, families, like, can you find out what happens if my, you know, my joints are hurting? So I'm like, well, turmeric, and I'm like telling them the dosing and stuff. And so, like, then I like, got there and I realized so many of my classmates, they're either retired near retiring and everyone's asking them they're like well what are you guys doing here they're like we want to better our health because we've yes. worked in medicine and in clinic for whatever like 30 years 40 years and we're like we don't want to live like that anymore because now it's for us so if and when you decide to do it you can do it just for you you know yes. just to help you and your family because i've really changed a lot of things about the way we even we were eating healthy before but just also being mindful of the number of bites that we chew like i live with all boys right they all want to inhale their food yeah. they don't want to think about like <laughs> what they're doing they're already in that concept of after we eat dinner we have to do this or i want to yeah, do this yeah, so yeah. we started slowing down yes. you know and the pandemic has really helped because now they learn to garden yes. and I didn't even know like what should we garden what should we do and we've gotten to a very good place where that slowing down has really helped us process what's happening in the world yeah I think that's uh, such an important point you made that when we go into lifestyle medicine or integrative medicine to be honest with you I was my own first patient actually so I agree I think what I learned for myself has already served me all the hours and days and months I've put in to learn about lifestyle medicine. It has served me already to take care of myself. I am just a different new person. And I can see you are that person too now. So I agree. I think when a person goes into lifestyle medicine, that helps him most. And then he keeps spreading all that the knowledge and everything else to family, to friends, and to all the patients and to the world, actually. And mm -hmm. even to the animals too. So I think, uh, let me ask you the, uh, a question, which is a common question to many parents. Many parents, it's on the same line of we already have talked about it. Many parents in this uh, hustle bustle of life, in this stressful life, in this fast paced life in America, forget to have a mindfulness in their parenting. Many parents, I see that they're getting you know, anxious, they're getting stressed out, they're getting angry. They are actually at times uh, you know, physically abusing their kids. How can a parent, mom or dad, either single mom, single dad, or a married parents, how can they be mindful and how can they be calm and cool when it comes down to taking care of their kids? So first and foremost, how can we care for others if we don't care for ourselves? That seems to be the underlying issue. If the foundation is not strong, how can we build on that foundation? And caring for yourself, there's such a stigma with it right now that, um, oh, it's selfish. You know, it's not necessary. It'll happen when it happens. And to me, the way I start the whole talk with the parents about how can we be mindful is live by example. Are you caring for yourself? If you take care of yourself, your child is going to see what you're doing because children are affected more by what they see than what they do. And so if they see, oh, you know what? My mom is exercising. You know, when I, like right now, obviously gyms, everything is closed. When I exercise, I bring my kids into the room. If they walk in, they can, they can participate. Um, I have this like in-home device that I use. I'm like, just do it. Cause then they get excited. Oh, I can do this too. Look at my kick, look at this. And you're living by example. When I'm outside and we started our first official garden proper this year in March, my six-year-old, almost six-year-old, he feels like he's in charge of the garden. So when we're there, we have no devices, we have no screens, like nothing is there. It's me and him in the fresh air talking about how 
We've grown a zucchini. We have lots of San Marzano tomatoes and green beans. And he takes ownership. I teach mindfulness through nature, through our everyday life. Like we, especially for kids, it's very difficult to say, okay, let's sit down. Let's close our eyes. You know, I do breathing exercises with them. And that's like a common thing that I teach a lot of parents, but a lot of it's for us too, you know? So if we breathe with them, it helps, but create, putting it in a box, I think is the most challenging because they're not going to buy into it. You have to buy into it too, before you can sell it, any product, right? You have to believe it before you can sell it. And mindfulness is one of those products. No, I think I agree with you. I think as a parent, just as any individual, we have to lead and we have to teach by setting our own example. And I think uh, we have to start by taking care of ourselves first. You know, I think uh, self-care is not a, is not a selfish thing to do. Self-care is probably actually a much more of a noble and much more giving thing to do. Because if you take care of yourself, then you will be of service to other people. So as a mom, as a dad, you have to take care of yourself, number one. Number two, I think you have to spend time with them physically, mentally, spiritually, because time is the most valuable thing you can give it to your kid. It's not the toy. It's not the expensive education. It's the time you give them. They will remember the rest of their life. So time is very important. And that time has to be a quality time where there is no screen time. There is no TV. You are sitting one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two, spending time in the nature as much as possible and eating healthy together by setting an example, doing meditation, doing some kind of uh, you know learning uh, thing together. So I think I agree with you. I think as a parent, we all have to just stop and think how our grandparents raise our parents. If we just remember that, I think we will be okay. We probably don't need to read that many books. I think my grandparents, the way they raised my parents, both on mom's side and dad's side, are the example I want to raise my kids. Our kids are, our daughters in medical school, son went to Harvard Law. So kids have done well. But I think uh, I think as a, as a young parent right now, who are in the 20s and 30s, they have a lot more things on their plate than what I had, and even possibly you had. So I think we need to teach these parents, take care of yourself, lead, lead by example, don't get stressed out, things will be okay. Most people do well in life, particularly in America. So just uh, so just, just chill and just be calm. So my next question to you is that, which was an important point you made when we talked about it, that uh, um, when we come down as a parent, we don't realize that we all are gonna leave legacy as a parent, not just to our kids, but our grandkids, great grandkids, and they all will remember that four generations back, Dr. Payal Patel, Dr. Ajay Shah, were my great grandparents and they left this legacy for us. So please expand on that, that what kind of legacy we should be leaving to our kids, grandkids and great grandkids. So when most people think about legacy, they think about property, or finances or special like jewelry or something they pass down from generation to generation and the most important thing that i ask my clients is like what is your parenting legacy that you want your children to have um and the answers vary you know everyone has their own thing and for me i think that's something that i struggle with and i struggled a lot because i was home with my boys for four years after they were born i took time off of clinical medicine by choice um, and it wasn't easy coming back and so I was always hard on myself I wanted to be the best of everything even the best mom because of course you have to be the best doctor the best mom the best child everything so I had struggled with self-compassion so what I'm working on for myself is self-compassion so I want to pass that on to my children to have that self-compassion and loyalty now, when I say loyalty, it doesn't mean loyalty to just like your family or whatever your profession, but I think loyalty to who you are as a human being. Don't forget who you are. So that is what I you know, emphasize for myself. Some other people, they have other things like honesty or trust, whatever it is, but really have to put some time into thinking about that because if we don't think about it, it's not going to exist. You know? And I think as a family, if you are in a... A uh, situation where there's two parents, you know, you're married or you have a partner. Um, it's important to have these conversations because, yes, it's important to find out what's for dinner tomorrow. Do we need to go to the groceries? Are you on call? Yes, we get that. That's important. But the things that the kids are going to remember generations from now is how they felt in the home. 
Did they feel safe? Did they feel loved? Um, did they feel like you had time for them? My son, actually, since we've been home, I've been doing a lot of work on my computer. And every night we have that time, we have a routine. We've had it ever since they were babies. They brush their teeth, we um, read books, and we pray. Recently, the prayers have been mostly related to like the health of the world and you know um, equality and things like that. Well, my son said to me yesterday, he said, uh, mommy, I pray that you don't have any work tomorrow. I said, why are you saying that, Om? And he said, because um, you're so busy, mommy. I said, well, why do, you, why do you think that? He's like, well, you know, usually when we're home, you're free. And I said, that's true. But guess what? Mommy's not going to clinic anymore. So I have to do my work on the computer. But I took that to heart that my son is seeing me a lot. And I'm coaching, so I have no option. I have to be on my computer. So then I decided close my computer. And I said, we're going to do whatever you want for the next 15 minutes or 30 minutes. I gave him 30 minutes, actually. He, we created some game. We did it. There was no screen, nothing involved. His heart was so full. I said, are you, you think mommy spent time with you? Oh yeah, you spent time with me. Can mommy go do her work now so that we can do this kind of stuff later? And I did that with both my kids separate. Wow. See, I think this is exactly what I want every mom and dad to hear, that uh, legacy is not like you said, money or property or jewelry or anything like that, because those things can go away in one second. It's the memory. It's the teaching you give it to them. It's the it's the it's the compassion. It's the passion. It's the work ethic. You know, it's a it's a love for the family, love for the human beings. I mean, all those all those things are the one people will remember for generations. And I think I want my grandkids or my great grandkids to say that Ajay was a nice person. If, I, if, I, if I'm alive, if I hear that after 30, 40, 50 years, that will give me much more joy. You know, and, and I want them to say that he worked hard for the family, he worked for the humanity, and he just was a nice person. That legacy is more important. Obviously, we all need material things in our life. And fortunately, in America, most of us get it. But at the same time, when we go in that rat chase, to accumulate more and more and more and more wealth. I think that's when we miss the boat of parenting. We miss the boat of influencing our kids and our grandkids. And that's, I think, needs to change in America. And I'm glad you are mentioning that because many parents, many professional parents forget that. That is the time, like we talked about, it's the time the kids need. Like you just gave your son 15 minutes and that's all he needed. He felt like he got one year in that 15 minutes because it was totally totally dedicated 15 minutes there was no distraction and it was all 100 percent to him i mean all those things parents need to learn that have a dedicated 100 percent unconditional time and unconditional love when the kid needs you uh my next question to you is which applies to you as a pediatrician that if a parent wants parent wants to know that what is the healthy lifestyle for a child, let's see about age five or so, between age five and age 15. So um, as far as a healthy lifestyle for that age, I think I would first encroach on the concept of good sleep, movement, so the different pillars. And I would ask, what do they do for movement? Because especially now when everyone's home a lot, I've been hearing about a lot more video games, a lot more screen time. And of course, we have to give our give that space, you know, because this is not a we don't have anyone else to look to for what would you do in a pandemic, because this is the first time we're really experiencing it with all this technology. Um, so I would ask, you know, about the movement, the sleep, um, the new diet, you know, um, what we eat really is, and I say this a lot to my kids, I'm like, you are what you eat. Right. So if you're make, eating foods that are high in carbs, um, that are like uh, artificial flavoring and all that, like your body reacts in a way where you're sluggish. You don't feel that vitality that you would feel if you eat something like more fresh, you know, and it doesn't have to be complicated because none of my suggestions that I give parents are um, how to make their heart life difficult. It's the opposite. I say, whatever you do, you incorporate your child. If like exercise, I incorporate my child. Cooking, my kids both have cute little aprons and they try to cut, 
you know, stuff. And then I let them mix and I teach them how to do different things. And so incorporating that. And then um, the last thing was, yeah, I was like, come on, there's one more point, relaxation. How does your child decompress? Everyone decompresses very differently. And I can give the best example of my husband and I. Like when it's bedtime, like his head can hit the pillow and he's out, right? That will never happen to me. I need like the hour before or maybe two hours because in my house, bedtime is bedtime because after that, it's me time. And I'm very particular about that, even in the pandemic, like I need that space. So I know what I need to decompress. So I do some reading. I do some brainless, you know, sometimes I watch some cooking shows or whatever I enjoy, you know, just to like let my mind go. Kids need the same thing too. What do they do to decompress themselves? And both my kids are like that too. One hits the pillow, he's out. The other one, he's like, mommy, can I read? Can I read? And I'm like, that's not a bad thing. You know, of course, for my selfish purposes, I'm like, I want you down by a certain time because I don't want to check on you. But I give him a half an hour so he thinks it's special to read, you know, and I've noticed that he sleeps better that way. So A, understand your child and then know what he, that would work and wouldn't work. And if it doesn't work, tweak it. Because we're not perfect, you know, nothing is perfect. And I always say we're imperfect parents raising imperfect children in this imperfect world. Yes. Right? Yes, that's the best way. To, that's the best way to put it. No, I think I agree with you. I think uh, when we talk about the six pillars for adults, I think obviously, you know, unfortunately, some kids do have substance abuse and alcohol, even at age 12 to 15. But most mm -hmm. kids need the healthy eating. And we had a guest yesterday, actually. He is the president of the National Health Association. And he's kind of a unique person. He grew up, American guy, white person. He grew up never, ever eating any meat products in his life. So he's 69 years old. He never had a dairy ice cream. He never had fish. He never had any meat. And his point was, and that applies to what you just said. His point was that the way his parents instill those values stayed with him until now he's 69 years old and he looks so healthy and so mm -hmm. fit and so lean so i agree i think those habits of nutrition if you start early then kids just continue that they don't need to go back and read books on how to eat healthy they are just ingrained in their head what is healthy food and they have seen it they have experienced it and kids who eat healthy get less cold less uh, autoimmune disease. I mean, you know, all the fiber and everything else, microbiome. I think in terms of the sleep also, but I want you to expand maybe a few more minutes on sleep. Like how many hours of sleep an average kid, let's see, you know, you can give breakdown in different age groups, but for adults, I know it's about seven to eight years, but kids need more sleep. So please expand on that. So um, like you said, it depends on the age of the child. So looking at the early infant and toddler years, um, well, babies, they basically just sleep, eat, you know, and get their diaper changed. So that's like, they're basically sleeping a lot. But as they get older, I really enforce the concept of healthy sleep habits in that because they're really sleeping almost like 14 to 16 hours a day, right? So the environment is super important. Um, I was a stickler about sleep training. I think some parents, it's, it's very different depending on how you grew up. I have some friends um, or some clients, they said, we slept in our parents' bed until we were like 10 years old or whatever it was. But for me, I felt that I couldn't be a good mom if I couldn't sleep well. So at about six months when I started solids and I tell my, my patients who are willing and wanting to look for better sleep habits to instill like a routine in their bedtime. So the same routine that I was telling you about earlier, we started and it would start like at 6.30 p.m., 7 p.m., you know, for like uh, my child who was six, eight months old. And they slept through the night, but it, it took time to do that. When they started sleeping through the night, I noticed a change in their mood during the day. Kids who sleep well at night also sleep well during the day. So that was great until there was naps. Then as they become the elementary school age, um, I highly recommend a good routine and a good sleep schedule. Um, usually they sleep about 10, 11 hours at that point. Um, as they get older, you notice that they resist the, the sleeping at night. Um, usually it's the falling asleep because um, 
I'm suddenly, I keep saying I have an eight-year-old now, but I call him a teenager because he's sleeping in so much in the morning. And I don't know if the tension is gone of, we got to get to school. Um, I have to get to clinic, hurry, hurry, hurry. So he's been sleeping a lot more, but they've been getting a good 10, 11 hours of sleep at night. Now the teenagers, and that is where I get the most resistance from them is they feel like they're missing out on something. Like, I don't want to waste my time sleeping, you know? And so they really need closer to seven to eight hours. I mean, I understand teenagers who during the school year, they used to not sleep well and then just crash on the weekends and make up for it. But your body doesn't, you don't feel good after that because then you're groggy after that. So right now, especially when they're home, I know there's been later sleep time because they're older. You can't control when they go to sleep, you know? But as long as they get their seven, eight hours, they're going to be okay. I know it's hard for parents. They're like, but like they're waking up at 10, 11, 12. Like, how do you manage this? My only, I would say recommendation right now is let's have compassion for each other. They're going through a lot of trauma and they don't know how to deal with it. So some teenagers are dealing with it by buffering and using gaming or phone or internet, whatever it is, and then sleeping, you know, or oversleeping. So when things go back to normal, um, I would recommend seven to eight hours, but that age, they have to understand it. They have to understand, like, I need this for myself. A lot of times I tell the teenagers, I'm like, you don't know what you're missing out on. I would kill to sleep the way you can sleep right now. But as we get older, we can't do that, even if we want to, like, I mean, I'm sure, you know, you can agree, but a lot of like moms, we're just like, our, our mind is just like, the sun's up, okay, gotta get up. I wish I could sleep till eight o'clock, but that doesn't happen anymore. So good, healthy sleep hygiene is what helps. The caffeine, I think is another issue with the older kids because they started having these energy drinks and that affects the sleep. So temperature, food, caffeine, um, I still use white noise for my kids. And we actually use it in my, our room too, because we are so sensitive to our partners. You know, they're moving, they wake up, sometimes they're on call, whatever it is. So I try to protect that for myself. So that's what I would say, healthy sleep hygiene. No, I think that's a great point you made. I think uh, sleep is such an important thing and it's been so under appreciated and I think adults more so, but even kids more and more. But, you know, the way I have learned, I think I tell adults, uh, my patients, and I would even tell kids if I was pediatrician that when you sleep well, you look better next day, you will have a better date, you will, you know, you will be more charming kid in the class, you get better grades. You are physically, athletically better if you sleep better. So I think we need to give kids some tangible benefits of overnight good sleep because they don't understand. They are not into this longevity yet. They are only 10, 15 years old. They need to see what's going to help me tomorrow. Am I going to look better? And that was actually a study done where when they analyzed this uh, young girls, and they were asked not to sleep for 48 hours. And their photographs were evaluated by independent people. And they actually look less attractive just by not sleeping for 40. Now, I'm not talking all 48 hours, just sleeping less than six hours for two days in a row. And they were less attractive to the independent observer on their pictures. So I think I, I tell all this thing to people that if you want to look good, if you want to get a better date, if you want to be a better athlete, if you want to get better grades, if you want to get into Harvard, Better you sleep well every night. I think then they start to then they start to appreciate more the value of sleep. My next yeah. question to you is, uh, which is an important question because it applies to many kids, including you know at times myself, including even many of our kids. That how a kid when is taking a test, and many times they get they get test anxiety or performance anxiety. Many times they are worried about their grades. Many times they are worried about their future. How can they be so mindful? few days before the test, hour before the test, and during the test? Okay, so that's a really good question. Um, I will take it step by step. So a few days before the test, um, I would recommend for them to visualize them in the test. Visualize the environment, visualize the method of the testing, visualize the material. Doing some 
I want to call it meditation because they're not going to be as like, you know, attracted to that term. So I say visualization, but doing some quiet time and thinking about that and taking deep breaths while they're thinking about it is basically training their mind to when they are in the test and then suddenly the anxiety builds up, what do you do, right? Because if you don't practice something, you're not going to remember it later. It's just like um, playing a sport. You know, you have to practice it. Even coaching, you have to, it's a practicing your mind, uh, mindset. So in the test, uh, I teach them a little trick about their breathing. Um, the one thing that's beautiful of mindfulness is when you utilize your breath, you know that you have it all the time until you die. So, so if you only need your breath, how can you utilize your breath to help you in that tense? stressful situation. And this is not just for the kids. This is for all of us adults too. So in, um, so Dr. Weil, he taught us um, the simple four, seven, eight breath. I simplify it for the kids because that's too many numbers for them. So I tell them to sit up comfortably, inhale for breath, uh, four counts, one, two, three, four, hold for four, and then release for eight. That itself, doing it maybe three to four times will relax them. Maybe they need a couple more breaths, but no one needs to know you're doing it. You're not making a big scene about this. This is even for us. We're going to go into the room for a patient who we know is demanding. We feel frustrated. We're exhausted. So what can we do? A couple breaths before you enter the room, it's not going to hurt. <laughs> or my favorite scenario is you're going to see your least favorite relative. And you can't avoid it. And there's this, you know, party or something. What do you do? Nobody knows that you're doing that. And you can feel it in your body because your shoulders will come down. You'll notice your heart um, rate will come down. And then you're not like feeling tense and sweating. You're almost like, okay, it is what it is. You know, I'm just going to do it. Once the test is done, I tell them to kind of leave it like in a bubble and just let it float away. Let it go away. Once it's gone, it's gone. We cannot control our past. Thinking about our past only causes worry. Thinking about our future only causes anxiety. So why do we introduce those feelings into our life when we know that they're not going to serve us? We can only focus on our present. So this is, I tell them in their words because they don't like too much of that big like language that we use, but I think it's useful for all of us. No, I think that's an excellent answer. I think we all need to learn how to not just take a test of life, how to perform well, whatever situation we are in. And many times we ask kids to not have performance anxiety or test anxiety, but many adults also, you know, when they are having a job interview, there's nothing but a different type of test. And we all need to follow what you just taught us. And I think it's very important. And actually I have, and again, I'm not, I've not gone live on that, but I'm going to do it soon. I've created a systematic step, how to get a good score on US MLE exam. And I made it because our daughter is in first year medical school in Philadelphia. And I said, I will help you everything in my power to get the best score in US MLE. So I've been kind of almost creating a your type of plan, visualizing few days before then uh, doing the meditation, doing some physical activity, getting enough sleep, you know, and then uh, eating a healthy food and all those things. Just, I think, uh, so that's a great thing that uh, I also learned from you too. My next question to you is, uh, again, very important question. Many moms and many parents for that sake are puzzled that is breastfeeding a important thing for the child? I personally think it is. I was breastfed. Our kids were breastfed. Uh, and I personally believe now that the benefits of microbiome and the mono, I think it's called uh, mono oligosaccharides, MOS, or milk oligosaccharides, milk oligosaccharides for our microbiome, or kids' microbiome is so important. So I personally feel breastfeeding is underutilized in America and many other countries. What do you think of breastfeeding for every child? So um, I'm happy you brought this up. I feel like there's been a shift now um, towards understanding the importance of the breast milk, the content, but not only what the milk has, but also the process of when you're breastfeeding, 
the bonding that happens. And so like we were talking about the pendulum swinging, um, you know, my grandparents, like that was like, that was all we had, right? Like they just had breast milk and, you know, they're just like survival mode, right? And then my parents' generation, I was born here, um, breastfeeding was kind of looked upon, like down upon, like, oh, like if you have money, why would you breastfeed? You can just give them the formula. And so like, I wasn't nursed at all. And so when I had my kids, um, I was like hell bent on, I'm going to nurse my boys. Well, one at that time, I didn't know I was gonna have another one. And to the extent of, I told my boss, I'm not coming back to work because there was no way I could function as a human being. My son was nursing every two hours, day and night for six months. Now that's too much. I'm not saying that's normal. But I didn't know because as a mother, I was very stressed out. I wanted to do what was best. And we lived in an apartment um, in New Jersey and with and like a condo and uh, everyone else who lived in the condo building were single, older and didn't like children. So every time he cried, I didn't know how to make him stay quiet. And my husband was in fellowship. And so I felt this pressure. So I would nurse him. So he was overfed. Um, and then he was gassy and colicky. But for me, that experience, I still felt like it, I was exhausted, but I still enjoyed it. A lot of people, and this is when I say breastfeeding is not always the best. If it's causing so much strain to the mental health, of the, the mom, because we live in a society now where we don't have multi-generational help. You know, back in the day, my grandparents, they lived with us, you know? So yes, there was a lot more work to do, but you could know that some adult is watching your kid hopefully not fall down the stairs, you know? Like that's just how it was. The nuclear family unit is so stressful because everyone feels they have to do everything on themselves or by themselves. And that is causing an extra kind of stressor. And so I tell my clients and I tell my patients, I say, do what is best for your relationship with your child. If you're gonna resent your child, if you're gonna be angry and frustrated, your child would prefer to you to be rest, rested, calm, loving. So it's okay, do what you can. Even if that was the right journey for me, it may not always be the right journey for every mom. You know, and some people, they can't afford to stay home for four years like I did. You know, yes, we, I made a lot of changes. We, we, all, we bought our first house only like two years ago, you know, and I've been working as an attending for how long and my husband too, but that was okay. And that was okay to me. But I want everyone to feel like comparison is only poison in every aspect, comparing yourself, your children. Um, your adult children, like what school are you going to? Like what profession? Because when I grew up, the only options were doctor, doctor, and doctor. We have zero <laughs> doctors in our family, zero. Yeah. So I'm living the dream for my parents. Luckily and thankfully, I wanted to do this, you know? But I tell everyone, I say like, let people be the way they are because we're also different. We can't put everyone in a box. So that's what I would no, that's, like a, that's a good point. I think like we talked earlier, self-care, if mom is not, you know, mom is getting stressed out, doesn't make sense to, you know, breastfeed the kid. At the same time, I, I sincerely believe, I personally believe reading more and more about breastfeeding now, that uh, if mom makes an effort, even if uh, has a breast pump and gets some milk out and, you know, provides that milk to the child, if mom cannot be home all the time, there's some value. And I think uh, you can always supplement with outside you know, formulas and other things. But I think do the best you can. At the same time, I agree, we all are individual. Uh, I think uh, we cannot, I think I 100% agree, a loving mom who has not breastfed versus a mom who is not loving has breastfed, the benefits of loving mom is a lot more than the breastfeeding. I agree with you. So I think uh, everybody has to individualize their own scenario. Uh, my next question to you is that I read on your on your site that uh, you strongly believe that children are the biggest teachers for all of us. Please expand on that. Well, I gave you that example, right? You know, when my son said, mommy, um, <laughs> you know, I have to, I have to keep saying mommy, mommy, mommy for you to look at me, you know? Um, and so many times we feel like we know everything, right? Like as adults, we're like, we just know it, you know? And 
those little moments when I hear them say something like that, it helped me reflect on how I'm perceived. And that was so important. I was like, oh my God, that's crazy. And so from them, I have learned that, you know what? I'm talking about mindfulness. I'm like, you know, trying to coach people, but I need to practice what I preach. And so I really believe if we look at our children, we look at our adult children too, there's so many things that you can also learn from, you know, your child who's like studying right now, like their passion, uh, their uh, work ethic, you know, of course they're learning from you, but you can also learn those lessons from them because I think when we are closed-minded, no one, no one grows. Growth can only happen in discomfort. So you have to be open and vulnerable to it. Yes, no, I agree. I think that's a great point. And I, I also agree that kids can be some of the, sometimes some of the best teachers for us. I, I remember distinct examples. Even our son, our daughter, they actually asked me to pause and be mindful and then think it through the situation, even when they were 5, 10, 15 years old. And the most funny example, just from a month ago, I got a brand new iPhone and I asked our daughter that, should we have this phone uh, uh, kind of connected to AT&T at the store. And store had like a four hour line because of COVID-19. And our daughter said, no, I can just do it at home for you, dad. And she was home because of the COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And she did that whole AT&T connection, mm -hmm. whole transferring all my apps, all my notes, mm -hmm. like in 20 minutes. So kids can teach yeah. so many things to us, so many. And I think if we have a two-way street of teaching and learning from each other, from the kids, then we always would be a better parent and a better you know, communicator with our kids. So my next question to you is very important question that as, a, as a, I already mentioned earlier, as a mom, as a spouse of a busy cardiologist, as a working physician, as a life coach, how do you juggle and how do you balance all this thing within 24 hours? Obviously right now your schedule is different, but when you are in a full-fledged commuting to your work just like six, eight months ago, how are you managing everything? So I have accepted the idea that we can have everything in life, but just not at the same time. Uh, and I'm very open to the fact that right now is not the time for me to be the chief of pediatrics. <laughs> I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that because this season of life requires me to give more time and energy to my children. When they were infants, they needed all my time and I was okay with what I was going through. I didn't fight that stressor of, oh, I need to still do this and I need to still do that. So what I do for myself is pick and choose what's important to me. My schedule is a little bit nice because I work pretty much part-time hours. Uh, so the other days I make sure I fit in fitness after school drop off, I'm very particular about that because that makes me feel like a better mom and I get that energy. I'm strengthening myself so I can be healthier for my family. Um, I also choose to follow my passions. And that's when coaching really came into my life because it was always there, but because of COVID-19 and because clinic was closed, I went full throttle, full time into it. So. It, it was a change for me. So what I would recommend and I would say to everyone is pick and choose your top three things that are most important to you and only focus on them. Your next top three things maybe in the next couple of years might change and that's okay too. So when my kids are older and I know they're going to be like, mom, you embarrass me. Can you go back in the car? I'll say, that's fine. I'm going to go do something else. I'm going to work more. I'm going to do whatever I love. Right now, they still are like, can you hold my hand? Can you hug me? Do you kiss me? They're not embarrassed of me. So I'm going to utilize that as long as I can, you know? So you have to pick and choose what's important to you. And it's different for everyone. Maybe it is important for you to be the chief of pediatrics, but it, it's not for me right now. Yeah, I think that's a very good answer that everybody has to think what's best for themselves at this particular time. I think maybe 10 years down the road, you could be the chief of pediatrics, but right now you have chose to do whatever you want to do in life. And that's the best option for you right now. My next question to you, which is a very important question that uh, we all are you know, after the happiness. I've given a three, four hour lecture on happiness. 
And I call happiness as a new currency because uh, everybody can have happiness in life, rich, poor, white, black, Indian, American, everybody can have happiness in the life. You don't have to be billionaire to be happy and billionaires are many times unhappy. So my question to you is that as a parent, having a child, does it enhance happiness or does it sometimes make you unnecessarily stressed? And I've seen data on both sides. Many times I've seen data that single person or many times just parents without kids have actually quote unquote, somewhat of a more happiness. But in my opinion, that data partly are skewed. I think I, my sincere opinion as a parent, personal experience, that when I get the parenting joy, that gave me the most joy. And we also have data that when a person is giving responsibility of a live being, even a live pet or even a live plant, forget the kid, they actually live long and they are much more healthier and happier. So I personally feel that having a child gives you joy. Besides the joy, it gives you health and it also gives you longevity. So what are your thoughts on that? So I knew you were going to ask me this, and I had to write this down because I didn't want to quote the article wrong, but I was reading in positive psychology. Um, they describe something as the parenting paradox. And what it says is um, that having children reduces happiness, even though if par parents think that it will make them happier. And like, you're probably thinking, wow, she's like, really doesn't like being a parent. And that's not true. But it's like, and I actually posted this because I got so many people, some people very defensive, some people agreed and they said, I haven't been happy. So then if this is the truth and this research shows this truth, what do we do? We don't have kids. No, that's not true, right? People still choose to have kids. And why do people choose to still have kids? So if parenting can't bring you happiness, what does it bring you? It is a powerful source of life satisfaction, self-esteem and meaning. It's very important because the article said a lot of parents choose that meaning overrides the quest for happiness. So to answer your question, yes, parenting reduces happiness, but it brings so many other things that are more value to us. Um, and of course it reduces your happiness. Cause they're like, let me just give you some examples. Like how much time demand do you have to put into parenting? sleep deprivation, <laughs> um, energy demands, work-life balance. And right now you're probably experiencing the financial stress of being a parent, right? Like people who don't have kids, like they don't have to pay for college or law school or medical, whatever, you know, like they don't have to do that. So of course there's those stressors, but if there's those stressors and we understand this, what can we do? What can we do to find that balance and find that joy? And these are the kind of the recommendations that this article gave, which is really good, is first realize you're not alone. None of us are alone in this. That you're struggling, I'm struggling, we're all struggling you know, in this. So you don't feel alone. Take care of yourself in the process. And we mentioned the self-care, but when you take care of yourself, this parenting um, kind of exhaustion, it's lessons. You know, and over time, you'll realize that you're not going to be changing diapers forever. You're not going to be paying for law school forever, right? They're going to be able to do, you know, that on their own. This is where my coaching work comes in. Reach out when overwhelmed. I truly believe that we all feel like we have to suffer in silence because it looks bad, makes me feel weak, look weak. Um, other people do it. I should be able to do it. And that's when we lose more happiness. So be open to get the help that you need. And then the final point was, um, know that you are in power of writing your own parenting journey. Everyone writes a different journey for themselves. Mine has been so unique out of the box for a typical pediatrician. Um, yours is different, like who does this kind of work and does these you know, talks, but we decide, that's what coaching brings. You decide your story. No one decides your story for you, you decide it and you pick and choose what will bring value and meaning to you. No, that's an excellent point. I think uh, parenting is a joy. 
parenting gives you a lot of other benefits, but I agree with you. It brings a lot of responsibility and some of those responsibility can be labeled as unhappiness. I agree with you. I think uh, the, the energy consumption, the financial burden, the sleepless nights, all those things can trigger a lot of the issues in your own health. And that's where I think balancing self-care. And I always like that example that when we fly, they always ask us to put the oxygen mask on ourselves. I mean, they are not dumb. Even the kid is the smallest kid. There's always a put on yourself first. And that applies to everything in life that you have to take care of yourself. My, I have two more questions. One question is, how does this COVID-19 affects the kids and how can we make sure the kids are safe during this COVID-19? So first and foremost, there is two components. That there is that getting infected with COVID-19, and then there is the effects of being in quarantine and what is that gonna bring later on. So right now, we all do the obvious thing. You know, isolate, uh, wear a mask, make sure they wash their hands. In the beginning, I, my kids really didn't leave the house unless we were walking in our neighborhood. Um, and it was doable. But now that it's gone on for long enough, I said, you guys, you know, if you guys want to come with me to get groceries and we need some fruit, it's okay. Put on your shield and let's go to Whole Foods. I allowed that. But they understand to keep their hands in their pocket, you know, and be aware that this is what's going on right now. Now, the other side of it is, what is the long-term effects of children growing up in this situation? We're not going to know that. We're not going to know that at all. And I, my recommendation, and I actually spoke about this in the beginning, was communication is key. Making sure that you speak to the children at their level and be honest, but don't project your fear and your anxiety onto them. Because when you do that, even subconsciously we do that, they, they take it in too. So please, I would say like, I'm like, please everyone be mindful that our kids are gonna need a lot more nurturing even after we're not wearing masks, even after we're not worried about this stuff. Um, I mean, the older kids, they have missed major milestones. Graduation, prom, college, jobs. I mean, it's all of us, we've been affected by this. And I think that all we can have is compassion for each other and ourselves. No, I think that's an excellent point. I think this COVID-19 not only has been physically, you know, tolling on us, but mentally also. And I think, like you said, many of the great milestones for these kids have been missed out. And I think uh, I really feel uh, kind of uh, personally disappointed by this COVID-19. But at the same time, this shall pass. I think we will, we are resilient. We, you know, as a parent, as a kid, we are strong, we have a good resources, we have good leadership, and I think we will prevail. And I think that this will be, in my opinion, a, a kind of a learning, uh, uh, learning uh, example. I think uh, this will bring you know, some family togetherness, like some more gardening. And I think that this will actually definitely teach us that how can we survive with the less resources? And I think environment is better, animal cruelty is better, people are eating less meat. So I think there are positive things. Obviously at the same time, a lot of people have died, 140,000 people have died, a lot of people have lost jobs. So, you know, there are, there are sad things happening, but we have to make best out of every situation. So my last question to you is, what is your message? Not just to parents, not just to kids, but to all of our followers, including adult followers, what is your message in terms of living a healthy lifestyle and living long? I think I want everyone to know that we are in charge of our lives, our health and our destiny. We have to choose us. No one is going to choose you. You have to choose you. And if that means eating healthier, sleeping healthier, choosing the right thoughts, then so be it. But pick you because no one is going to care for you the way you can care for yourself. And you should write your story so that in the future, you're going to look back and say, I am so happy that I made these decisions. And I'm happy that I wrote my story the way I did. So that's what I would say. Yeah, I think that's an excellent answer. I think, uh, again, thank you for coming on. I really absolutely enjoyed it. We are impressed. We wish you the best. Wish your kids the best. 
And uh, I think hopefully we'll meet in person one day. I have a lot of relatives. Yeah. My two cousins are in LA. So I think we come there often. So yeah. I think once this COVID-19 is over, we'll definitely yeah. reach out to you. But uh, please stay in touch and say hello to everybody at home. Thank you. Yes, I will. Thank you.